Well, good afternoon, good afternoon, <clears throat> or I should say evening. Well, we had a beautiful, beautiful day today. Sorry for all that. <clears throat> nice and warm, we hit 91 degrees and our humidity dropped down to 31. We're at 33% and 84 now. Everybody thinks we are warm and tropical. Warm, yes. Tropical, no. We are warm and dry. We are very, um, very dry in Alabama. At least where I am. More like Texas, Arizona kind of thing. Warmth, not a problem. But humidity, yeah. We'll have some rain coming. It'll be better. But um, right now we're a little on the dry side. I've been coming out in the morning and spraying them. They seem to love it. Um, tonight they're going to get a foiler feed. Um, <clears throat> most of my plants are thick leaf varieties. Um, I don't have that many. I have a few on Sidiums. They're going to get sprayed regardless. But um, the thin leaf varieties, their stomatas open more during the daytime versus the thick leaf like a Cattleya or a Vanda Dendrobium. Um, most of mine are thick leaf varieties. It's kind of a self-preservation method the plants use to keep from uh, losing height, l losing moisture through their leaves. <clears throat> so they open their stomata more at night. Um, so I'm going to they do better being fed at nighttime or in, in the evening, cooler temperatures. I'm I'm sorry. I just keep on checking things and keep looking and keep checking and keep looking. It's so nice to have them outside and watch them starting to develop, even just in a few days' time, just the, <clears throat> just what I'm seeing. And new shoots coming out, new roots starting to lay down, and more new roots coming down from deep inside, just growth, growth, growth. Um, On the menu is going to be about 135 parts per million of um, little cow mag, some better grow. Um, urea, surprisingly enough, is the better nitrogen for foiler feeding versus like nitrate or something of that nature. Urea is the best for foiler feeding, um, <clears throat> which, you know, that changes the, the type of mix you might use if you're going to go to start spraying more like I am going to start. Um, I may not be using my calcium nitrate but quite as often as I thought I would. Um, <clears throat> They're going to get some cow mag, they're going to get some better grow, they're going to get a pinch of Epsom salt, magnesium sulfate, and I'm going to be adding some potassium in the form of um, seaweed kelp. Um, especially with the temperatures like they are, the potassium will definitely come in handy. They will love it. Um, and I'm slowly building up those reserves and building these plant tissues up and building these plant tissues up for, um, for fall. And other plants that are going to bloom even during the winter, summertime. So. Just kind of moving everybody around. They're still kind of finding their own position, and I'm trying to get used to the change of temperatures. This is just going crazy with the root growth deep down underneath and everything. It's just lots and lots of roots. That's great. That is so great to see. I'm going to keep just let it keep going, keep going. I'm not going to take the straps off for a while. Those aren't going to be that hard to pull out. Um, I want to make sure it's anchored really, really well. That plant did real well. I was concerned that out of those three pieces, how much of it you know would make it, and how, how much of it wouldn't. But um, other than just losing a tiny leaf or two, a majority of it it held on just fine. Um, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> I should have known better. I'm just out here looking at things. That additional potassium, knowing what the minerals do, knowing what different different nutrients do, how the plant utilizes them, how they interact, you know, all that good stuff, how the mechanical part of it, the mechanical process of it, 
for somebody to just say, oh, potassium and phosphorus, those are for blooming, that doesn't really help you at all, does it? Not really. Um, <clears throat> and that's actually not the truth. Potassium really isn't used for blooming. Is it important during blooming? It's important during blooming. It's utilized more during blooming, but it's not, it doesn't actually have anything to do with the blooming part. I know that really explains things, clear things up, doesn't it? Uh, you know, it's how to, how to take what you picture in your head and what you, what you think and what you're thinking, how, you, how do you put that into words, um, especially for me, it's tough. To get that visual across, um, every single cell, every cell, well, back up a little bit, potassium, potassium, the, you know, the main thing that potassium is used for by plants, potassium is used, its main purpose is plants use it to transport nutrients and liquids, water, etc., through the plant. That's what it's used for. Basically, they take potassium, potassium ions, and they the plant will pump it from one cell to another cell to a next cell to the next cell to the next cell to the next cell and what that does is they the cells like to in essence without getting all the technical terms and everything in essence the cells like to be balanced if they have nutrients they like to pull in the water to balance things out if they have too much water they pull in nutrients to balance things out the plant uses that to to move nutrients that process to move nutrients around the plant from roots, stems, all the way up that stalk, and when they get that big long spike out, all the way up that to the very last flower on it has to have potassium. Every one of those cells, all those cells, got a whole bunch of them soaking in the pool here. <clears throat> There's that pepper plant. Look at the size of it now. Look at the size of it. Actually, you don't know anything about that, do you? Never mind, forget I showed that to you. Anyway. <clears throat> All that potassium from cell to cell to cell, they have to pump potassium ions for each cell, each cell, each cell, all the way up that plant, not just once, but continually, 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 all the way to that last bloom. So with all those, how many millions of cells do you think there might be in a small plant like that right there? Quite a few, right? Quite a few. And all that potassium has to be pumped back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. <clears throat> So they use a lot of it. They utilize a lot of it. Now it's a mobile nutrient. They can move it around, but once they get balanced, anything that disturbs that, they're going to senesce a leaf. They're going to drop a leaf or they're going to eat a spike to get that extra potassium to continue going on. They have to use potassium to move liquid and fluid around there. That's why this time of year when it's so hot, that's why it's so important this time of year to make sure I keep your potassium levels up. Um, just a little bit of extra, make sure my mix has a good potassium level in it. You know, that's another thing. If you look at the NPK numbers, typically that K number, that last one, or, which is potassium, a lot of times that's really, really high number if you look at on most good mixes. Why? Because they utilize so much of that. It's knowing how the plant utilizes, then you make your own decisions. But if you have a bunch of cells and they're just in a big row here, big circles in a row, the plant's going to take potassium, pump it to the next cell, and that in turn, it's going to make it absorb water. It's going to pump potassium to the next cell, and that in turn is going to make it absorb water. And it has to continually do this on and on and on and on. All right? Now, so with all the heat, I'm going to make sure that they get a lot of extra potassium. Anyway, that explains that. Long-winded story, right? It got me to thinking the other day. I was looking at some more of those tissue reports, which those are great for getting information. One of the things I'm trying to figure out on my fowls is, I've got them to grow roots for a well. I don't have a problem with the root issues. I know about the pH on the roots and all the other stuff. Um, I've got them to hold on to their spikes pretty good too. By keeping their P and K levels up, they're holding on to their spikes. <clears throat> Barely. They're, re they're regrowing them, but they are holding on to them. Three spikes, four, four spikes, three spikes multiple spikes, even on the little ones, they're starting to hang on to the spikes and rebranch them out all the time. But I'm still losing lower leaves on Phalaenopsis. And everybody gets that issue. Everybody loses leaves on their Phalaenopsis. Um, I see it in books. I see people speak about it all the time and it's pretty much just a national phenomenon. Everybody, everybody says or just a natural process of, of the Phalaenopsis. <clears throat> the leaves get old and they die and they dry, die off. I really don't believe that. One of the main reasons is, again, I go back to those videos that I see every once in a while, not just on plants in the wild this time, but in people's gardens and other collections where they have fowls that have 20 leaves stacked up or more. They're not eating, they're, they're not recycling those leaves. They're not. 
It's the nest and those leaves back into their selves. <clears throat> why are they doing that? I got to keep asking that why question. I'm having the issue. Was I think I've got it? I think I've got them where they're not doing that. It seems to have stopped, stabilized, stopped. Now I need to get them to go in the opposite direction and start producing more leaves without having any issues. This is one of the last ones I've got that's still having an issue with it, but I think, and that one just finished blooming too, and I think that's why. <clears throat> if you think about it, potassium is key to this. Why? Think about <clears throat> if you have that great big spike, and fowls are known for big, long spikes, multiple branching sometime. Even without, they have such huge blooms, big, big blooms, big spikes, big blooms, and a lot of them sometimes, right? Now, a lot of plants have big spikes and big blooms. Why would a fowl be any different? If you look at the reserve system that a dendrobium has, it has those big canes that contains a lot of nutrients and a lot of stuff, right? A cattleya has those big, fat, thick bulbs that contains a lot of nutrients and that's a lot of reserve material, a lot of reserve area, all right? Phalaenopsis have what? Just leaves. That's it. That's the reserves. So when they borrow nutrients from a, from a leaf, from a lower leaf, they'll lose that lower leaf very rapidly. They don't have a, a different type of reserve system. They don't have something to maintain the reserves uh, with any size or structure. Just the leaves is all they have. That's why they have thick, fat leaves. That's their moisture reserve and that's their nutrient reserve is just the leaves. But because of that, they're very susceptible to drop, leaf drop if they don't keep, their, keep stuff balanced. When they're pumping all that potassium over, and again, this is just my take on things, just, just the way I'm, I visualize it or the way I think about it. All that potassium being pumped continually, continually over and over and over will tax the system, all right? But it's a mobile nutrient, so they can kind of move it around and move it around and move it around and feed what they need to, move it around, move it around. As long as they're getting a little bit in their mix, it's fine. <clears throat> but then when something new happens, like the spike, they finish blooming, and they're going to re regrow new new spike because the environment is triggering hormones. Hormones are what tell it to bloom or to grow. So if the environment is saying bloom more, it might send up another spike or it might rebranch that spike off. And if it does that, it needs to have additional potassium. If it doesn't have it in its in its if it's not getting additional potassium in its environment, <clears throat> it's going to eat a lower leaf or possibly reabsorb a spike if one of the spikes if it's a multiple spike if if the environment is telling it to grow and it says it's going to start growing a leaf and it starts growing a leaf it still needs the extra potassium to pump all that extra fluid into the new territory all that new piping that's in that new leaf or in that new spike or that new blooms that's got a whole bunch of more you know it's almost like piping they have to pump all that into all the potassium to be able to pull water up through the plant that's what they have to do to keep that bloom hydrated when it's warm outside They've got to pump all day long, all day long, all day long using potassium. I know I'm kind of harping on that, but I'm trying to get a visual. I hope that's kind of gives you an understanding of what they, how they kind of use that potassium, why they have to have it. So when they're blooming heavily, as they're finishing up, if whatever Mother Nature tells them, start growing a new leaf, they are going to need some potassium from somewhere, and they don't have any other reserves other than leaf, so they drop it. <clears throat> one of the things that I'm trying to look up stuff on this, so I'm looking at tissue reports. When I find tissue reports on phalaenopsis during blooming, before blooming, after blooming, those lower leaves on the after blooming have almost no potassium left in them. They're very, very low in potassium levels. The other nutrients are, are fairly clear and standard across the board, but potassium, for some reason, potassium has been removed from the leaf and it senesces and dies off. It's because they need that for that flow. Now, with all the temperatures out here, <clears throat> as dry as things are getting, they're having to pump and pump and pump and pump to keep hydrated. They're going to use a lot of potassium. If I don't do something, I'm going to start losing lower leaves on it. So, gosh, this was such a long explanation of why I'm putting seaweed and kelp into my foiler feed tonight. <laughs> but that's the reason. I'm not spraying the geraniums here. But, um, if I can get them to hold on to their lower leaves, then the rest of it's just icing on the cake. It just blooms at that point. <clears throat> and that does have a little bit to do with some phosphorus, but um, again, different talk. But think about that potassium, especially in your environment. If your plants are outside or your plants are even inside right now and the temperatures are warming up, 
given that additional potassium because of the temperature change, they're going to be hydrating more. If they're growing more or if they start producing a new shoot, that's like a new pipe. That's like new plumbing starts showing up. They've got to have that extra potassium to fill it up. Does that make sense? <clears throat> now, if I had a... <laughs> I don't have very many blooms right now, but whatever plants that I had, if I had a large sunroom full of blooming plants, full of blooming phalaenopsis, or my my sunroom or my greenhouse or whatever was full of blooms, I would be making sure, especially with warmer temperatures, to give them plenty of potassium at this particular time of year. As they start to slow those blooms down, something's going to click. It's either going to tell them to rebloom again or it's going to tell them to regrow again. They're not going to go dormant this time of year, right? They're not going to start resting this time of year. So whatever they get triggered into doing, they're going to need that additional potassium just for water flow, if nothing else. They're also going to need nitrogen and phosphorus and calcium and everything else, but <clears throat> just keep that in mind about potassium and how important it is, especially with warmer temperatures, because of what its job is, moving, fl moving fluids. Okay. Again, just my take on things. I'm new to orchids. <clears throat> I'm new to it. I'm just trying to adapt some of the what I can find out to keep mine alive. I can keep spikes on them pretty good now, but um, and I'm really not that concerned about blooms at this point. I I can forego blooms if I can learn how to make the plant grow and grow properly and not keep eating itself, not keep dropping lower leaves or eating spikes and stuff like that. The blooms will come after that. I'm no tenfold, so I'm not worried about that. <clears throat> Hope that makes sense too. Anyway, I'm gonna go pull some of these guys out of here and get back to it. Right now, I'm just letting them hydrate, suck up, suck up just some straight rainwater. Then later on tonight, they're going to get sprayed. So, but I'm so happy with all the growth. I notice that little star has one new growth there, there's another new growth there, there's another growth coming up back there and another one back there, so it's got four nice big fat purple growths coming out. I'm sure the roots will come after that, but that's a really good sign. Since I've had it, I haven't had that that kind of um, growth production on it, so I'm hoping that with something on that wood again was keeping that plant just sitting there stalled like that, and um, I'll see a difference in it. That um, speciosum dendrobium. It's loving this heat. It's probably loving the warmth out here. Nice and crisp and hydrated. Looks really, really nice. Beautiful new roots. Ready? You want to go in? It's probably time to eat, isn't it? Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. <clears throat>